Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, trade tension reprieve. Chip makers fare just fine Friday, and Apple investors still seem to be celebrating President Trump's tariffs delay. We will talk tech and China trade, Tesla, and digital assistance with Loop Ventures' Gene Munster. Plus, elections at risk. U.S. states are struggling to safeguard their systems for 2020. How vulnerable are they to hacking? We'll find out. And the shelf lives of series. Some say just when you've caught on to a Netflix show, it's canceled. Why does the act seem to fall so quickly? We will explore. But first to our top story, the ongoing trade war between the U.S. and China. President Trump's decision to delay 10 percent tariffs on an additional $300 billion in Chinese imports hasn't stopped Beijing from vowing to hit back. China State Council Tariff Committee said that, quote, China has no choice but to take necessary measures to retaliate. Apple shares have rebounded since the news of the delay, and according to Bank of America, the iPhone maker is facing a much lower impact from tariffs as a result, and the impact to the company's earnings could be minimal if products are ultimately exempt. To discuss the continued trade standoff, what it will mean for Apple, we have got Gene Munster, co-founder of Loop Ventures with us, and in LA, our Bloomberg trade reporter, Sarah McGregor. So first of all, Sarah, fill us in on what's happened over the last 24 hours and what is the latest. Still no sign of just exactly how China might retaliate, right? No, we don't have any clear picture yet of how China will retaliate. And sort of to recap the week, you know, it's, a, it's such a whirlwind. I think in the trade war, there's been so many ups and downs that we've kind of gotten used to it. But I think by any measure, this week was uh, was a pretty crazy one. And if you looked at where the markets were by, by Wednesday, it almost seems like we came in like a lion and out like a lamb. You know, we're sort of everything seems to be digested now and you know I think what's clear is that the delay to the tariffs are going to help a few companies like you said sort of the apples of the world who have a bit more time to get their holiday gear in uh, while not helping some others like um, apparel makers and footwear makers who who will still get those September 1st duties and we're still no closer to a deal between the U.S. and China. Now Jean you've concluded that it's unlikely Apple will be hit by tariffs. That said, you still got AirPods, the Apple Watch, on the list for tariffs starting September 1st, which is just two weeks away. I mean, how likely do you think Apple's really going to dodge this? I think there's a high probability that they dodge it. Now I'd put that in uh, not in consensus, that thinking, Emily. I would also suggest that that is probably a more clear-headed thinking in terms of how this plays out, and I want to quickly talk about that. I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding in terms of how these tariffs are ultimately implemented. I think there's discretion from the administration on which companies to, to implement against, but keep in mind the goal of the tariff is not to hurt U.S. companies. The goal of the tariff is to hurt uh, competitors coming into the U.S. market. U.S. domiciled companies tend to get reprieve from these tariffs. And so I'm not saying that it is, uh, that there's no probability. I think it is a very low probability that, in fact, Apple will face any tariffs. Even after this uh, reprieve this week, I think that it largely speaks to the misunderstanding in the market. I have a strong feeling that uh, Apple products will not be targeted. There's another piece to this story, too, regarding Apple, is that uh, when you think about the symbol, this is Apple is a symbol, global symbol, in terms of the strength of a U.S. company. And if the administration would tariff those products, that undoubtedly would uh, be painful, would, would, would have a negative impact on Apple. And so the uh, simple takeaway, Emily, is I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about these tariffs, and I don't think Apple's going to be impacted. Hmm. Apple, of course, the biggest company in the world with the most exposure to China. But, Sarah, would you agree with that? I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the next hour, let alone the next two weeks. Well, we know someone like Steve Jobs has access to President Donald Trump. And so, you know, a company like Apple, it's true, maybe they're big enough and they have enough sway with the administration that they have the ear of the White House. You know, where we're really hearing some of the pain is, and these include some smaller, you know, tech companies, people who make gadgets or 
or, or you know, like I said, apparel makers, footwear makers, they haven't been able to have the same sort of influence, I guess, to keep their, their items off the list or get those delays. You know, at the end of the day, the Trump administration, you know, t we heard from Trump yesterday saying, you know, tariffs are a pressure point for him. He's not afraid to use, but there's there's a, a lot more tools in his in his chest. And I think, you know, a really big issue for these tech companies to watch out for, of course, is retaliation from China. They have fewer items to hit from the U.S. because they import less with tariffs. So are they going to hit investment? Are they going to make it harder to do business in China? Are they going to make it harder for companies like Apple or other companies to sell their products there? You know, it's, it's the big question right now. Tim Cook has had several meetings with the administration, with the president himself. That says Apple did ask for a tariff reprieve on the Mac Pro. Uh, the president said he would not grant that. So, Gene, let's walk through a couple of different scenarios here. Let's say September 1st, the Apple products that are on the list for September 1st, AirPods, Apple Watches, etc., are tariffed. What's the impact on Apple then? So, um, uh, Emily, before we jump into that, I, I do put this in the heavy speculation category. I want to remind people that this is going to take a year to play out, but I think it's important we do go through that. So let's say that watch and AirPods are, in fact, there's some form of a tariff. And then you have to look at what the percentage is, and let's say it increases the cost by somewhere between 10 or 20 percent. Uh, what is the impact on Apple? Keep in mind, those two segments are roughly 10 percent of revenue, just under 10 percent of revenue. Uh, and uh, that would have a negative impact on that 10 percent. Every percent of growth is important for investors. And so if that did happen, that would be an example of something that would have a negative impact on Apple stock. Um, but that would probably be the context. I could see that in particular having potentially uh, taking out maybe a half or one percent of Apple's uh, revenue if that was implemented for a year. Keep in mind, this is just for the U.S. too. I, I misspoke there. I said 10 percent of revenue, but the U.S. portion of that is actually more like 3 percent of revenue. Um, now, let's take it a step further. December 15th, the iPhone is tariffed. What then? So uh, iPhone 60 percent of uh, revenue in the U.S. Uh, it's uh, about a third of the iPhone revenue and so all in we're talking about 25 percent of uh, the business. Then the question comes up uh, who's going to pay for that and I, I don't have a good answer uh, whether that's going to be Apple or shared with the consumer. Uh, but that again would have a negative impact. What you would see in this case uh, I think or again a very r low remote probability this happens but if it did happen you'd see people essentially holding on to their phones long Longer. The upgrade cycles would be uh, 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 stretched out. Uh, I, it would not be a situation, I think it would be unlikely that somebody, for example, would would leave their iPhone for a Galaxy, uh, some sort of a Samsung uh, device, but it would have that kind of negative impact. If you're going to ask me to put a percentage on that, that's something that could have a 1, 2, 3 percent potential impact, albeit very unlikely. Now, Sarah, for companies like Apple that have deep roots in China, need to maintain a relationship with China as all of this is going on, how difficult is that at this time? Absolutely. And sorry, I did misspeak before. Of course, I meant Tim Cook, not Steve Jobs. I'm living in the past there. I'm sure they both have influence, but it's Tim Cook who's visited with Trump. You know, a lot of bigger companies are able to um, shift their supply chains, and we have we have seen that. Of course, it's not an easy or costless pr uh, process, but we saw a co company like Crate and Barrel say they're going to do less of their sourcing in China. We know that imports from Vietnam through some of the ports here in the U.S. are up. So, you know, we do see some of those signals that the, um, you know, those trade, those maritime trade um, ties are, are changing. But, you know, these are these are deep relationships built over time. And I think just to say that companies can, you know, start changing their production lines or, or source it from different places is is a little bit too, too simplistic at this point. And also to, I think, the Trump administration's ultimate goal that, you, you know, companies are going to set up shop here and just reshore all of their production is, is also a little bit um, tough to imagine. You know, obviously wages here are pretty high and there's, um, you know, there's a cost to, to setting up your production here as well. So uh, we're, we're still seeing how it plays out. But right now it does look like there's some shifts from China to lower cost places in South East Asia. All right. Uh, Bloomberg Sarah McGregor continuing to follow the trade dispute with us, as well as Lou Ventures, Gene Munster. Gene, you're sticking with me for more.
Um, and staying on Apple now, its $14.4 billion battle with the European Union reaches the bloc's courts next month. The hearing will throw the spotlight on the antitrust commissioner's crackdown on tax deals doled out to big companies. In August 2016, the European Commission ordered Ireland to recoup the record sum plus interest, saying the world's richest company was handed an unfair advantage. Coming up, continued anticipation for the release of new electric cars from the likes of Audi, Jaguar, Honda. But will anyone be able to take on Tesla? We'll discuss. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Electric vehicles are poised to top 100,000 registrations in California this year, gaining a rising share of the state's car market. That is counter to a downward trend in sales overall, with annual deliveries expected to fall 4.6 percent, according to a report from the California New Car Dealers Association. Tesla registration surged to over 40,000 in the first half, giving it a 4.2 percent market share in the U.S.'s most populous state. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg Auto reporter Craig Trudell and still with us, Loop Ventures co-founder Gene Munster. So, Gene, obviously the electric car landscape has shifted dramatically in the last year and will again this year. How do you think Tesla will fare against new competition? I think they're going to fare exceptionally well. And uh, to put a finer point on that is uh, some quick numbers here is about call it two percent of the cars sold year to date in the U.S. have been electric. Tesla has call it 75 percent market share. Call it uh, 65 percent of uh, the total U.S. market share is around the Model 3. Rough numbers here, but gives you some uh, perspective. And uh, what we have looked at is how sustainable. The answer to your question is, will they fare well? And ultimately, it comes down to what are the alternatives for consumers? Uh, a year ago, there were essentially 11 cars that were available in the U.S. market. This year, there's 17 electric cars in the market. So the quick math would say there's more competition for Model 3 and Tesla. But if you take a closer look at that 17 number, they basically break down into largely two camps. One camp of $70,000 and greater in price, which is not a mass market car. And the other is uh, vehicles that have range of 130 miles per day or less. And so uh, that is another market that really isn't feasible. The sweet spot is less than $40,000 and greater than 220 miles. And that really boils down to five vehicles. And let me uh, finally get to the answer, the punchline here, is that in that group of five, there is essentially the Model 3, the Chevy Bolt and Volt, and two Hyundai cars that I suspect most of your viewers have never even heard of. Uh, essentially, if you put those five cars together, the only car that people are going to buy is the Model 3. Hmm. Now, that said, Bloomberg has been reporting on a fascinating story out of Germany, and, and Craig, I'd like you to speak to this, the story of a rental car company called Next Move that placed a big order for Teslas, got the first 15 cars, and there were problems, moisture in the headlights, scratches. Tell us what happened there. Yeah, this was a really interesting story where you have a, a company called Next Move that uh, is really trying to be this sort of leading uh, electric vehicle rental company in Germany. And they have a, a very sort of, you know, uh, to be sure story here. Uh, to Gene's point, the, the Model 3 is a very attractive package. Uh, it offers uh, a range that, that uh, you know, is, is feasible for a daily driver. Uh, and at an attractive price point, there's a lot to like about Tesla in terms of over the up, uh, over the air updates and you know a cool brand that that uh, Elon Musk has built, but uh, the the big criticism that this company Next Move has leveled at the company is is really that they they don't uh, sort of have their sales and service organization uh, in, in that country sort of in a, a position to be able to handle uh, repair work in a in a smooth way, and that was the the big knock that this company has sort of leveled at at Tesla. So after those uh, first 15 deliveries that you referred to, uh, they were uh, going to take delivery of another 85. Uh, uh, Model 3 cars, but that was called off. So uh, definitely signs of, of a lot of work to be done uh, in some of these markets that, that we expect to be, you know, a real key driver for Tesla to be able to uh, continue to expand. Meantime, Craig, didn't Tesla in this particular case try to deliver cars that had already been registered, therefore wouldn't count towards new registrations? 
Yeah, there, there is a, a concern on that part of what, uh, whether or not that's just an isolated incident. Uh, Tesla definitely sort of uh, downplays it as, as that. Um, uh, they describe it as an issue of matching uh, VIN numbers, uh, vehicle identification numbers to vehicles, and uh, you know talked about the idea that this was resolved. But certainly, if your if your next move, uh, if you're buying, uh, making a bulk order, uh, you want to to be able to take advantage of tax credits to uh, to uh, help uh, sort of subsidize uh, that purchase. And that was a major issue uh, for next move. And so you know that combined with some of these quality things that you refer to. And, and the weight on uh, repair work uh, that they described uh, to our Christoph Rauwald in, in Frankfurt uh, combined to them really sort of uh, being very disappointed in the experience of, of dealing with the company. So, Gene, you know, what's your reaction to that, given that Tesla is clearly the leader right now in electric cars, but certainly not without problems that could prevent new buyers from jumping on board? That's uh, everything that Craig outlined is that's negative. There's no doubt about it. And uh, my simple reaction is to take a step back and to look at the bigger trend here is that uh, Tesla has quality issues. There are some quality issues around it. And I think that those are generally under the magnifying glass uh, because this is a company that is in the news becomes under the magnifying glass. I'm not a I don't own a Tesla. I do not own shares of Tesla, uh, but I try to keep uh, a, a clear view of what's going on. And my, uh, my response, Emily, is that yes, there's negatives, but the bigger picture is this is still a compelling value of what is an undeniable truth that cars should be electric. And so if you put that together and we'll have the proof of this, the substance of this is going to be see, very simple. What are the delivery numbers in the September quarter? If they move up from the 77,000, it was a surprise number in June move up from that number in September I think that's going to be a powerful sign that despite all of the of the the problems that get reported around quality there's something bigger going on and that simply is that people want electric cars all right so Gene I have to ask you because your answer begs the question why don't you own a Tesla uh, I don't I don't own a Tesla <laughs> uh, because I am uh, uh, Loop Ventures is two and a half years old and I promise to return my money back to our investors before <laughs> I get a new car. All right. Uh, good answer. Craig, look, what's next? Tesla you know, clearly has some challenges. We've got the second half of the year coming. What are you going to be looking out for? So this is a, a company that, you know, in addition to working through some of these uh, service issues, I think a, a big second half story is going to be how, how quickly they're able to uh, finish up a, a plant in China. I think there's really a, a major concern uh, of, of the trade war sort of flaring back up. Uh, being a, a, a major risk to this company because despite the fact that uh, that China puts massive uh, tariffs on, on imports of uh, vehicles built uh, in California, Tesla's uh, built a, a pretty significant business in that market. And to the extent that they're able to finish up the Gigafactory outside Shanghai uh, and, and really start, uh, you know, spooling up production locally, I think there is a, a substantial opportunity there for, for them to keep expanding. Uh, they, they set this, uh, you know, sort of ambition to be able to finish this plant, uh, you know, to later this year. And it, it really is an ambitious timeline that they set. So uh, I would not be surprised to see that timeline slip. It's often what we see out of, out of Musk that, you know, he, he sets a goal that's really a stretch and uh, Tesla, you know, maybe maybe hits it, maybe doesn't. But the, the bigger picture that Gene is talking about here is, you know, can they they get, uh, you know, production started in China? Because once they do, I think that does unlock a significantly bigger market for them, uh, you know, a, a bigger segment of buyers for them in, in China. All right, Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, uh, thanks so much for weighing in there. Uh, Loop Ventures, Gene Munster, you're sticking with us because coming up, proof that digital assistants are getting smarter. Gene's got some new results of an IQ test posed to Google, Siri, and Alexa. Who understood the best? Who was the most accurate? We'll tell you next. This is Bloomberg. Digital assistants are taking over, but 
does Alexa, Siri, or Google understand you best? And which one answers the most correctly? Well, the results are in. Gene Munster of Loop Ventures back with us, uh, who just recently conducted his firm's annual digital assistant IQ test. So, Gene, who won? Uh, Google once again uh, pulled away with the win here. 93% of the questions were answered uh, correctly. That compares to a year ago when 87% were correctly answered. Second was Siri with 83%. That's up from 77% a year ago. And Alexa was third at 80%, and that had a big jump from 61% accuracy a year ago. So if I was going to put it all together here, Emily, is Google won uh, an unprecedented number of correct answers, and I think Alexa made a huge improvement. I, I think it is uh, worth really mentioning here, too, is that this uh, the survey we do, we ask each of the devices 800 questions. It ranges through five different categories, everything from uh, commerce to information, uh, commands and uh, ultimately uh, there is a bigger insight too about the winner if you will is that these devices across the board have had unprecedented improvement in their ability to answer those questions and I just want to uh, uh, emphasize this point is over the last two years since we've been doing this is that on average each of them has increased their uh, accuracy by 30 percent so they're getting much smarter so do you think that, you know, the, the lead that Google has, at least in your survey, is enough to impact sales and give it a boost? No, this category is just so small, but where it matters is that the idea about voice and the use of voice as it becomes the fabric of other products, whether it goes in your phone or other aspects, that is something that just allows people to rely more on Google products. And so this is part of the idea is that uh, Google's business needs to become the fabric of different products that we use. That's in particular to Google. And I think on that note, when we think about the functionality, especially Google hitting 93% accurate, uh, what does that mean for the average person? The average person uses these for only three things. It's for music, weather, and timer. Uh, but in fact, uh, Google's a great example of like the information category. It does exceptionally well. If you ask, for example, what are the side effects of cough, uh, uh, cough syrup, uh, it will answer that. And I think that where it starts to matter for Google over the long term is people start to realize that these devices have uh, more use case outside of the three areas they're using it today. That's where it becomes a bigger deal. All right, well, we'll be watching as the market gets bigger. Loop Ventures, Gene Munster, as always. Good to have you here with us on the show, Gene. Thank it's a you. Pleasure. <laughs> Coming up, states and local governments are going to have to spend big ahead of the 2020 elections, but will they have the resources they need to do so? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Now to a story we are continuing to follow, safeguarding the 2020 U.S. elections from interference. A new report from the Brennan Center estimates states will have to spend more than $2 billion to protect their election systems in the next five years. That means replacing outdated machines, purchasing software to protect existing equipment against hackers, training employees. The problem is they don't have enough money. So is 2020 at risk? To discuss, we're joined by Maurice Taylor, senior technologist for the Center of Democracy and Technology, and in Ann Arbor, Michigan, J. Alex Halderman, professor of computer science with the University of Michigan. So, Professor, is 2020 at risk? Unfortunately, yes. We know from the recent report of the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee that in 2016, Russian attackers probed uh, election infrastructure in all 50 states. And we have every reason to believe that they're going to be back again in 2020. Um, so what then, Maurice, are states to do? Well, I think it starts with basic cybersecurity training for local election officials. 
um, convincing state level legislators to look at longer term funding solutions uh, and most importantly uh, advocating at the federal level for short term election security uh, dollars to make sure that we can have an impact immediately and help defend 2020. That said, it doesn't seem like those dollars are coming through. We've we've had $380 million Congress has distributed to states, but um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell blocked a bill that would distribute an additional $600 million, and, and states need far more than that, they say. No, they certainly do. The Brennan Center report uh, said that we need at least $2 billion over the next five years to help secure elections. And Congress seems to be interested. There are over 30 bills that have been introduced in this session alone. Uh, it just seems like nothing's going to get through uh, Senator McConnell. So, Alex, with time running out, what are the options? I mean, the election now is about a year away. Well, fortunately, securing the election isn't going to take any breakthroughs, and it's not rocket science. What states need to do, they need to make sure that we have a paper trail with a paper ballot for every vote, that that paper trail is audited manually to make sure the computer results are right, and to implement basic cybersecurity hygiene. Um, compared to the cost of securing almost any other area of critical infrastructure, the healthcare sector, the, the power grid, um, $2 billion is a real bargain. So what do you mean by a paper trail? I mean, even if they're voting electronically, sh they should vote on paper as well? Well, we need people to fill out a piece of paper to mark their votes the old-fashioned way, but then to scan it into a computer in the polling place. That's the way most of the country votes today, but we've got to get every other state on track. When you have that paper record and the electronic record, we can make sure they agree, and it's much stronger than either voting by computer or voting on paper alone. Now, uh, Maurice, Bloomberg did a story this week focusing on the state of Illinois and their efforts. Another state, they say, you know, they haven't gotten enough money. Uh, this is a state that was singled out in Mueller's special report. And what they determined is that Russian hackers infiltrated the system, stayed inside for three weeks, and meddled with 200,000 voting records. What is the sort of worst case scenario? Is it possible that Russian hackers could swing the election by tinkering with the number of votes? The possibility of actually changing the outcome of a nationwide election is going to be relatively small. Uh, the larger concern is actually disrupting the operational side of elections, so causing long lines on election day or causing confusion with a targeted disinformation campaign. Uh, that's really what we're looking when we're talking about how are the elections in 2020 going to be impacted by foreign influence. Now, Alex, one thing that's certainly different or will be different in 2020 is awareness. Elections officials, states, all of us were aware that this can potentially be a problem. But I wonder how much does that matter given that hackers, you know, you know bad actors are always one step ahead? Well, awareness is the first step to prevention here. Um, but we've got to go way beyond awareness, and we have to bring every state up to uh, a strong level of protection because, as Maurice says, um, the attackers are out to undermine people's faith in democracy, and really potentially hitting anywhere in the country could be enough to make voters doubt whether their vote will count. So you've done some experiments on voting machines yourself. What did you find? Well, um, I and, and other researchers have uh, reverse engineered many of the most widely used voting machines in the country. And unfortunately, in virtually every case, we've found ways that an attacker could come in remotely and infect the machines with uh, malicious software to steal votes, in virtually every case. And unfortunately, the machines are often closer to the Internet and more centralized behind the scenes than people believe. So um, the, all the more reason why we need that paper trail and auditing in order to protect them. But doesn't that prove that if someone is determined to break into these machines, they can? 
Well, the great thing about having that physical paper trail is that paper can't be changed in a cyber attack. So that provides a way to go back and see whether a, an attack has taken place and to correct it. So that's the best kind of defense that we can provide. And it, it may seem low tech, but there's actually a lot of science that goes into how do you design and easily audit uh, a paper backup. So Maurice, look, we're, we're a year and change out from the election. We're aware uh, states are working on it, but they don't have nearly as much money as they need to protect themselves. What's your prediction for, for 2020 and how smooth or not it will be, given that there have been hiccups in almost every election of sorts? Well, Election Day is sooner than you think. You, know, you need to work backwards and think about which states are having primary elections. And then working backwards from there, using the mindset of an election official, how much time does it take to actually prepare for Election Day? And looking from that perspective, there's not a whole lot of time left. So there is still some time left to do some uh, basic things like cyber hygiene or taking a look at auditing procedures. Uh, but there will always be more elections. So if we at least start with doing the basics now, we can plan for protecting the elections in 2020, 2022, and beyond. But if we don't start, we're never going to be able to adequately protect against a growing threat. All right, Maurice Turner of the Center for Democracy and Technology, as well as Alex Halderman of the University of Michigan. Thanks so much for covering these issues. Okay, Amazon is designating products sold by certain companies as, quote, top brands. It's a test that, if widely implemented, could ease tensions between the online retailer and consumer goods companies. Amazon already labels certain products as best sellers or Amazon's choice. Coming up, explosive growth, massive losses, potential conflicts of interest, and financial gymnastics. We've got an assessment of the WeWork IPO filing next. This is Bloomberg. A new owner for the Brooklyn Nets, Alibaba's executive vice chair and co-founder Joe Tsai is paying about three and a half billion dollars for the basketball team and its arena. He previously had amassed a 49 percent stake and had until 2021 to exercise his option to take control of the club. Well, it is so unicorn. It hurts. That is what our Bloomberg Opinion share Ovide has to say about WeWork. The shared office space company is expected to raise around three and a half billion dollars in its upcoming IPO, which would make it the year's second largest behind Uber. WeWork lost $690 million in the first six months of the year and almost $3 billion over the last three years, along with some, let's say, unique business dealings by the CEO. One person who has a unique perspective on the company is Shira Ovide, who joins us now herself. Shira, you also say that the IPO filing reminded you of a lower stakes Mueller report. What do you mean by that? What I meant by that was, I think what we saw in the Mueller report was, it was good, I think, for the President of the United States that a lot of the revelations in there were things that people had been reporting over the course of several years. And that made it, in a way, maybe less shocking than it might have been if, if this had just been dumped all at once, all this new information. And I think WeWork was the same, that because there has been good reporting um, on WeWork in the last few years from our colleague Ellen Hewitt and other people in the media business, we've been able able to see some of these companies in all of its uh, both glory and shame, right? Both the fast growth and some of the good ideas the company has infused into the commercial real estate industry, and also some of the bad things like a lot of these intricate financial arrangements between the company at CEO, the wild losses, the kind of willy-nilly spending on all kinds of things. So both good and bad, we um, had the blow a little bit cushioned for us by years of reporting. So let's talk about the financial arrangements between the CEO and the company. Uh, in one case, uh, Adam Newman, the CEO, took out a loan from the company, a massive loan. In fact, there were several interesting agreements made between Newman and the company. Walk us through some of these. I mean, they're quite unusual. 
Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen anything like what WeWork has done in terms of its relationship with its CEO. So, for starters, he owned several buildings personally that he leased to the company, which is an unusual kind of arrangement the company has now moved away from. He has borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from banks and others, in part backed by his ownership of WeWork shares. He has a couple of family members who have done work for the company or currently work at the company. His wife is one of two or three people who would pick the next CEO if Adam Newman were to die or become incapacitated. The company recently restructured into this kind of partnership in a way that seems to personally, uh, that seems to deliver tax advantages to Adam Newman and others. I mean, the, the kinds of things, uh, financial arrangements between the CEO to his uh, to his own interest is again something I have never seen before. Certainly in the kinds of companies that I write about. This was another one that raised my eyebrows. The founders trademarked the word "we" and then sold it back to the company for six million dollars. Yeah. Why wouldn't they just do that through the company? I don't know. It's it's a very good question. I mean, it's it's obviously not on the same scale as a lot of the other financial arrangements, but I do think it goes to the heart of this company and questions about its kind of corporate governance and whether the company is able to say no to the CEO. Right, so why would the board, by the way, it's an all-male board, why would the board allow this? <sighs> I mean, I, I, I can't. I can't be in their heads. I can't really explain their actions. I can imagine that you know they believe it is in the interests of the company to own those trademarks, and it so happened that Adam Newman or the companies that he controls own, had owned those trademarks, and so they wanted to control it at the company level. All right. Uh, well, we'll be seeing how investors receive this as the company gets to market. Uh, Bloomberg Opinion, Shira Ovide, thank you for keeping it colorful for us, as always. Switching gears now to cancel culture, but not the Twitter outrage kind. We are talking about Netflix and its quick trigger finger when it comes to axing new shows. But is that really the case? Was Netflix any quicker to cancel shows like Tuca and Birdie or Santa Clarita Diet any quicker than HBO would end a John from Cincinnati or a Lucky? To answer that, let's bring in Dallas Lawrence, the CCO of OpenX over the phone. Dallas, some people may never have heard of those shows because they didn't last long enough to uh, really enter the n n public consciousness. But Bloomberg did some reporting and found that actually Netflix wasn't quicker than HBO or CBS to cancel its shows. Netflix shows just may get more publicity and they clearly have a huge budget. Um, you know, what is your take in general on how much mind share Netflix is winning as these competitors like Apple TV Plus and Disney streaming service and Warner come to market? Well, I think your your article actually nailed it just right. There's there's always a feeding frenzy over any new news about uh, Netflix. But I think at the macro level, there really is kind of a Dickinson, Dickinsonian story unfolding for Netflix when it comes to content. It's kind of the best of times for them, but also the worst of times. From the best of times, you know, they had 15 hour, 1,500 hours of new content created last year, really strong international growth and new mar emerging markets for them with localized content that's actually traveling really well throughout the region, picking up 15 to 20 million viewers. Some really strong tentpole programs we've talked about in the past, things like Orange is the New Black and Stranger Things. At the same time, it is kind of becoming the worst of times for them. And, and Stranger Things is kind of a double-edged sword if you think about their big tentpole programs. There's a program that had 18 million viewers watch the entire season in the first four days. At that clip, a Netflix is going to need to be bringing in 20, 30 tentpole shows a year to keep attracting those audiences. While at the same time, as we know, you know, seven out of every 10 minutes spent on Netflix is spent watching syndicated content, content like Friends and The Office, that is now leaving in droves behind the paywalls of these new services from Disney and Apple and CBS and, and Comcast. So it is a challenging time. I think you know, Netflix has really leaned in on you know, trying to create content that travels well. Um, but as you said, you know, because they're the biggest, every time we cancel a show, it seems to be headline news. So uh, of the coming competitors and the current competitors, what do you think is the biggest threat to Netflix? 
I think you know Netflix has two two fronts in the streaming wars. The first is content, as we've discussed. The second is just their business model. Uh, they have a saturation challenge here in the United States. They lost 100,000 uh, subscribers in Q2. Um, half the United States uh, households aren't streamers yet. They've not signed up for it yet, and they've looked at Netflix for the last couple of years, and they've not been enticed to join Netflix at a 12.99 uh, subscription base per month. Now, in the next couple of months, they're going to have an option to join Disney. And for that same exact price, they're going to have Disney, ESPN, and Hulu all bundled together. So I really think the business model is a challenge for Netflix as they think about it. Their decision not to accept advertising, for example, to lower that threshold, that barrier to entry for new subscribers who are waiting to kind of dip their toes in, is also going to be a challenge for them. So do you imagine there will be a big shakeup this fall or, or a changing of the guard, if you will, or new guards? I think we're going to see two big getting things. more powerful. Yeah, I think you're going to see, you know, if, as we've said in the past, you know, if content is king, who owns the castle is the big debate. And I really think Disney's in the pole position here. But you also have, you know, Apple coming online with a distribution model of a billion subscribers, you know, logged in, billion people who own that device uh, to download Apple. So you're going to have a double front uh, for Netflix competing on both some massive content providers, uh, but also some significant distribution that outstrips theirs. Now, the plus side for Netflix is most of that. Uh, battlefront for them is going to be in the United States. Uh, and they're going to still largely have the international market to themselves to continue to grow and regionalize their content. So, as I said, it's not all bad news for Netflix. Uh, there's good news in this as well as, as they grow, and ultimately good news for the consumer. We're going to have more choices, more options uh, that meet the consumer where they want, whether they want an advertising based model or a subscription based model. So, if you could bet on one competitor, who would it be? Disney? Disney. I, I think the Disney package they brought to the market today. For $12.99, if you're thinking about the 48% of American households that have not signed up for streaming yet, they've been waiting for something. They're now going to get to have their sports, their television channels, all of the licensed content, and the powerhouse Disney portfolio of Marvel Studios, Star Wars, Pixar, all for that same price. I think we're going to see a real tidal wave of new people coming into the streaming market uh, driven by Disney. All right. Open X's Dalex Lawrence. Uh, lots to watch, lots to discuss. Thank you so much for joining us. Still ahead, Google employees speak out once again. This time it is to keep the company from helping U.S. immigration agencies. We'll discuss why next. This is Bloomberg. Some early investors in the ride-hailing company Lyft will get their first opportunity to sell shares on Monday. The lock-up expiration was brought ahead from September 24th, as the original date would have fallen within Lyft's blackout period ahead of third quarter results. In a report published after Lyft's recent earnings, DA Davidson analyst Tom White said the company's co-founders Logan Green and John Zimmer will not be shelling shares at the time of the lock-up expiration. While employees at Google are calling on the company to promise not to work with U.S. immigration authorities on a cloud computing project, the petition signed by at least 70 employees says, quote, we demand that Google publicly commit not to support CBP, CPB, ICE, or ORR with any infrastructure funding or engineering resources directly or indirectly until they stop engaging in human rights abuses, by any interpretation, CBP and ICE are in grave violation of international human rights law. To discuss, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Bergen, who covers Alphabet for us, a lot of acronyms there, but explain what the Google employees want here. Yeah, this is a new tactic from them. Historically, in the past couple of years, we've seen uh, employees speak out against uh, the Project Maven, which is the Pentagon contract against their work in China. Now they're coming out and saying preemptively, the company should say, we're not going to work on these specific cloud projects. Uh, so the CBP, the Customs and Border Protection, put up this really fascinating um, contract looking for a type of hybrid cloud computing that Google had just earlier this year put out this new product uh, that they pitched sort of exactly like that. Um, it's not something that Google has said. Google said quiet. They've uh, they've not said if they're uh, bidding for that contract or others. Uh, but it's sort of a collision course where we see these largest Silicon Valley companies coupling their cloud computing with AI, and we see more and more government agencies um, wanting that. And this puts Google in an increasingly tough spot, especially as you know they're facing ac accusations of working with China, of treasonous work by Peter Thiel. You've got President Trump saying the U.S. Uh, government wants to investigate that, um, and, at the, and, and, and Google has had to take a stand on whether or not they're going to do work with the government at all. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you can see they put out a policy position on their sort of their ethical principles around principles around AI um, that was clearly written by a lot of lawyers. Um, you know, they've said we're going to continue to work with the military. Something on facial recognition, right? Google has said, okay, we're not going to release um, sort of open APIs, just like anyone can go up and access facial recognition technology. But they haven't ruled out not working on facial recognition tools. Uh, whereas we're seeing Amazon has, you know, looking at had a controversy with there, but much more willing to sell facial recognition tech to police departments, to local governments. Um, Microsoft has drawn a clearer line where they're saying we're willing to work with the government on certain contracts, and, and we believe that. Google has, their employees have really boxed in management, and management just hasn't responded as far as where they're willing to work and, and where they're not. Meantime, there's been this sort of continual drip drop of, of bad news about Google as a place to work. This is not a good place to work. Um, obviously, it's a huge company, and people have their own personal experiences. But is this impact, this pile up, is it impacting morale? And, you know, my sense is like there's, there's a bit of selection bias, right? We hear from the people that are complaining the most. Um, and, and recently we've been hearing a lot from uh, right wing and conservative members of the company that have come out in this, this series largely to, to right wing outlets, leaking documents talking about the pressure of, of the, the culture there being against conservatives. Uh, I've talked to people there that are saying, oh, it's a great place to work. It has been historically. Um, you know, I think the, the interesting turning point for the company has been one of the, the features of the company that touted and, and are certainly a recruiting tool is this open culture where anyone can debate anything, where they have free expression, where they have the time and resources to um, spend a lot of time having these internal dialogue. That's changing. Uh, we've seen in the past few years, uh, there's a great story in Wired about it, and we've done some reporting about it, how they've stopped having these open conversations with employees, uh, and that's probably where we're going to see a lot of effect in the morale. Right. Well, Clearly, still a lot of work to do. Bloomberg's Mark Bergen, thank you, as always, for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter. Find us there at technology. And follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.